of all the tools geologists use in studying the earth. Fossils are unique. Very special conditions are required for a living creature to be preserved as a fossil. Even under the best conditions, most plants and animals decay rapidly and so must be buried shortly after death to be preserved. Fossils can furnish two different kinds of information about the past. Some species of animals and plants flourished in many parts of the world and either appeared or disappeared abruptly. When geologists find fossils of such species, they call them index fossils because they provide reference marks on the long span of geologic time. Here in the Badlands of South Dakota, the fossil remains of a group of pig-like mammals called oreodonts first appear in layers called the Brule Formation. These animals developed rapidly and lived over wide areas in the Dakotas and Nebraska. Their fossils aid geologists in tracing these layers across the countryside by providing a marker for the relative age of these rocks. A second kind of information a fossil may provide is about the environment in which it existed as a living organism. The imprint of a palm tree tells us that the climate was tropical and moist. The presence of coral tells of ancient tropical seas. The tracks of a dinosaur leave no doubt that reptiles lived in this area millions of years ago. The most abundant life forms on our planet are the single-celled organisms. While most are far too delicate to leave any fossil record, there are two groups of protozoans that have shells of lime or silica. One group, known as foraminifera, build microscopic chambered shells out of lime. They are so common that their microscopic shells cover much of the ocean floor. Where such beds have been raised to the surface, they form deposits of chalk. The other group, called radiolarians, form their shells of silica. Their shells are extremely fragile, but because they collect in beds with the foraminifera, they are preserved. Perhaps the most common way in which fossils are preserved are as altered remains. Plant material in a swamp may combine with oxygen and leave behind only a carbon trace in shales or slates. Groundwater may carry minerals into and through a shell or bone, slowly replacing the calcium carbonate molecule for molecule with silicon or iron. One of the Best examples of altered remains is preserved for us today at Petrified Forest National Monument here in Arizona. Here, a hundred million years ago, a magnificent forest flourished. Flood waters eroding the, the land swept trees downstream into sandbars where they were buried by still more sand, or still other trees were swept down into lagoons where they slowly waterlogged and sank. Then as millions of years passed, the silicon was slowly introduced into the wood and replaced the wood molecule for molecule with agate, opal, chalcedony, and jasper. So that today's petrified forest tells us of magnificent forests which have long since disappeared. When oxygen is absent, such as at the bottom of a swamp, the mineral pyrite may replace the shell or bone. Such fossils are not only beautiful, but they tell us something about the environment in which they perished. Sometimes fossils themselves are not preserved, but they may leave behind indirect evidence of their presence. Shells or bones may dissolve away, leaving behind a mold with their exact shape embedded in the rock. The least common way in which fossils are preserved is as dried or frozen remains. This bighorn bison lived about 28,000 years ago along the banks of Dome Creek near today's town of Fairbanks in Alaska. When he died, the combination of freezing temperatures and dry air preserved the skin and other tissues. 
This kind of preservation is extremely rare, but important, because it gives us information concerning the animal's appearance, his habits, and his diet that couldn't have been learned any other way. Another way in which material is totally preserved affects only insects and is really the result of an accident. An insect blunders into resin and is buried in it. As millions of years pass, the resin hardens and is slowly converted to amber, preserving the insect intact. Most fossils are the parts of plants and animals that are hard enough to resist decay, such as bones and shells. Sometimes, they are found just as they were deposited. Here in northwest Colorado, near the Utah border, the National Park Service has preserved part of an ancient sandbar that became the graveyard for dozens of dinosaurs. Visitors can watch as paleontologists carefully chip away the rock around the bones so they can be studied or removed for reconstruction. This quarry has yielded the bones of ancient crocodiles and more than 14 species of dinosaurs, including Antrodemus, Ceratosaurus, and Apatosaurus. The work is slow and tedious. Small chisels, picks, and brushes are used with great care. The work at this site has been underway for more than 50 years, and it will be a long time before the excavation is complete. Yeah, I think this counter is telling you you got something in here. You and your Lewin Amir, Eddie. Yeah, but by golly, I believe it means it this time. At a site near Grand Junction, Colorado, called Dry Mesa, the largest dinosaur bones ever found are being uncovered by Dr. Jim Jensen and other paleontologists from Brigham Young University. The bones were buried in river sediments that have since changed to shale. The material is soft enough to be removed with picks and brushes. As the bones are uncovered, the scientists study them for clues as to their age and species. This area over here where we began work has already produced evidence of two new species. Now that makes the quarry worth it, just, just that alone. One new species justifies the quarry. But we have represented a long bone here of a herbivore. And just Some of the bones Dr. Jensen and his crew herbivore. found were of a species larger than any known to exist. We have some vertebrae of this dinosaur in another part of the quarry, and some of them are 40 inches long, one vertebrae. This part right here is where the spinal column fastens on. That's part of the vertebrae right there, and the spinal cord went through this little hole right here. The nature of the shale has made the bones very fragile. To keep them from falling apart, Dr. Jensen coats them with shellac. Then a plaster coat is applied to protect them during their trip back to the museum. Okay, you ready back there? We'll go over easy now. Getting the bones from the field to the laboratory can require the use of everything from small picks and chisels to hydraulic cranes and heavy trucks. It took a lot of hard work to get the large dinosaur pelvis wrapped and loaded for its long trip back to Provo, Utah. Wherever important fossil discoveries are made, Similar procedures are used to remove them for study. At the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., fossils arrive from excavations all over the United States to be studied by experts at the museum. 
Most are stored temporarily while they await their turn in the preparation laboratory. When the technicians are ready to clean a fossil for study, they bring it to this room and carefully open the crate in which it traveled across the country. The first step is to remove the plaster and fabric case that has protected the bone during shipment. They carefully begin to clean away the rocks surrounding the bones. Once again, a variety of picks and grinders are used, and it is a very slow process. Great care is needed to avoid damaging the fragile bones. Some bones are left partially exposed in the rocks. Others are completely removed and may be used to reassemble an entire skeleton. On any given day, several different projects will be underway in this laboratory, all aimed at expanding our knowledge of ancient animals and the world in which they live. Unique specimens are often too valuable to risk in shipping or to put on display. In order to allow scientists in other areas of the country to study them firsthand, specialists in this lab make exact plastic copies using custom-made rubber molds. This very rare fossil skull of a pygmy sperm whale was found in the coastal plain sediments of North Carolina near Aurora. Many plaster models will be made of this skull and circulated to museums and universities around the country for study. Scientists will use the models to learn more about life along the eastern coast of the United States more than 20 million years ago. The skull of this fossil oreodon is being mounted as part of an exhibit portraying typical animal life in the ancient South Dakota Badlands. Each bone is being mounted so that a complete skeleton will result. The work of the research labs is a part of the Smithsonian that most visitors never see. But an equal amount of care and hard work go into the exhibits and educational programs that are open to all visitors. After a great deal of study, artists can produce paintings and exhibits showing animals as they probably appeared when they were alive. All the exhibits are based on the studies done in the paleontology laboratories. Paleontologists at the Smithsonian have studied animals of all shapes and sizes, from the earliest primitive fish to late Ice Age woolly mammoths and from tiny rodents like this one to the gigantic Stegosaurus. As they study fossils, their goal is not simply to uncover and collect them, but to piece together a record of what life was like in the millions of years before man appeared on Earth. 